So I promised some more modern ciphers, and this lecture is now dealing with uh, stream ciphers. Let me though stay, take a quick step back and talk about uh, something we have already seen in the first historical ciphers lecture, namely the one-time pad. And let me give you the one-time pad in the simplest version, namely as an encryption of bits. So here we have our plain text and we have our key stream, and then the addition is simply addition modulo 2. So in the first position we have 0, 0 giving 0, 1 plus 1 giving 0, 1 plus 0 giving 1, and 0 plus 1 giving 1. What a coincidence that in an example in a lecture we're seeing exactly the four cases in the first four positions. Apart from that, um, this is basically the monkey here typing on the keyboard between zeros and ones. So the key stream should be reasonably uh, random. On the other hand, you see that I'm not actually very random. There are very few long runs of zeros or ones, and there are very few just very short runs. And then when you XOR or really add more to these two things, you're becoming you're getting the ciphertext which has many more runs of zeros and ones saying that I'm a very bad source of randomness. More relevant here, it's a very way, very easy way to encrypt. So if somebody has the stream of the or the string of the plain text and has a string of the key, they can get the ciphertext. And similarly, well, adding twice the same number modulo two is removing it again. So if you swap the roles of the ciphertext and of the plain text, then you would get the plain text back. So it's a, it's a great system, it's information theoretically secure, because when you're seeing a one in the ciphertext, like looking at those two ones which we have here, those two ones here, they're coming one from a one in the ciphertext, in the plaintext, and one from a one in the key. And well, so both ones, I mean the one could be coming either from a one here or one there, and definitely not from two ones in the positions. And similarly, the, the zeros in the first two positions of the ciphertext illustrate the two cases of zero in the plaintext or one in the plaintext. So seeing the ciphertext does not give us any information on what the plaintext was. Also, there is no correlation across symbols. So just because maybe somebody can figure out that my first symbol was a zero, and then they see another zero in, this, in the second position of the ciphertext, it doesn't give them any information on whether that also came from a zero or from a one. The only problem with this is that the key has to be as long as a message. And so they have, if Alice and Bob want to communicate with this, they have to extend a very long uh, string of bits in advance because they don't even know how many messages they're going to change, how long these messages are. And it's kind of operationally very cumbersome. And if you ever end up using the same pad twice because, well, maybe Alice thinks Bob didn't get it or Alice or Bob forgot to rip off a portion of this, then they're using what is called the two-time pad, which is really not what they should be using. It's insecure. So this means it's not a practical suite. Now, stream servers, on the other hand, are much more practical. These are functions that take a short key where nowadays that's 128 to 256 bits. If you look in older crypto systems, you might find as low as 64 bits. Um, but this is something that is convenient. Every party that, every two parties that meet could exchange such a key. And then they memorize this, they store it on the computer. And then the stream cipher is a math function which is taking only this key and cranking out a long stream of bits. I'm writing here typically bits or bytes, so it depends on what system you're looking at. So in, in some explanations, you're just outputting zeros and ones, and sometimes you're outputting eight bits, so one byte at a time. And we require that those numbers look like random, but well, they're mathematical functions on this key input, so they're just pseudo-random. Now, a good stream cipher, what it produces is something which doesn't have anything that distinguishes this stream from something totally random. So there could be somebody sitting there flipping coins, heads or tails, heads or tails, for a very long time. Or there could be somebody turning a crank on a machine which just has as a beginning this key and afterwards everything else is dependent on it. 
Also, if you have seen some of the bits, the next bit should not be predictable from that. So if you're seeing that the first one bits are 001001, it shouldn't be that it continues with any pattern. So it should be unpredictable. And that's also where our pseudorandom numbers in cryptography differ from, say, pseudorandom numbers that you find in statistical testing. For most systems, it's good enough if you have something which is not having any linear properties or higher order properties, but we really need something which is unpredictable and not just statistically looking like random. So there's a bunch of, of tests, there's the diehard battery of, of tests, and that's kind of the minimum requirement. So if you ever encounter somebody who's trying to sell you a stream cipher, they should have done those tests. When in 2005, there was an eStream competition, which was a competition to find good stream ciphers, because at that point, there weren't really many good stream ciphers around. Uh, we had gotten a lot more on the theoretical side, but it hadn't reached anything practical. There were just very few good systems. And they got a bunch of submissions, something on the scale of 30, but many of those didn't actually uh, even pass these very simple tests. So on the first candidate submissions, there were uh, some PhD students, I think even some master students who got lucky and could break a cipher by just running statistical tests against it and then say, hey, look, this doesn't even pass the definition here. Well, let's assume you have such a stream cipher. Then encryption with a stream cipher works just the same as with a one-time pad, where now the K from the one-time pad, the key, has been replaced by S, which is the pseudo-random output of this uh, stream cipher on input of the key k. But then again, it's just bitwise addition, or if it's byte aligned, you might see something where it's uh, addition module 256 or module 16 or something. Now, I mentioned before that the two time pad is an issue, and so I've gone through the effort of giving you an example. So, Tom, Tom, the two pad user, the two time pad user, um, here's an ASCII encoded thing, so D encodes to 44, E is to 45, so this is actually how the computer is representing the letters. And so when you encode your message in ASCII, then let's add, dear Alice, let's meet, turns into this string of um, hexadecimal numbers, so each number here is a number between 0 and 15, so A corresponds to 10, B to 11, till F to 15. And so then the addition that I'm doing is not bitwise, but I'm addition, doing addition module 16 to make it nicely position-wise. And I've written down there a maybe random pad that I'm going to X always. Well, this is not me. This is actually Tom, the two-time pad user. And Tom, the two-time pad user, um, as his name suggests, uses the same one-time pad twice. He also has a thing about starting his letters, letters to Alice as Dear Alice. Now, that's a politeness thing. If I send you a message, I would also write Dear So-and-so. So that's not per se a flaw, but the combination of using the one-time pad twice and starting the letters in the same way, well, you can, of course, you see the plain text here as well, but also just if you would be seeing C1 and C2, you would be noticing that they both start with 9, 8, AD, 8a, so exactly the part that I highlighted here in red, you would notice that, hey, this is fishy. This is this is too long for just the coincidence. So if Eve is watching this, and Eve is always watching, Eve will see every single message that Tom sends to Alice, because she's a curious one. So she will notice two things. She is pretty convinced that Tom doesn't understand what one time means. And she also learns that it's the same beginning of the message, because it would be too much coincidence to see the same thing twice if it wasn't for the same plain text and the same pet. And then, well, let's assume she managed to figure out that Alice and Tom met, so she observes Alice to go to a meeting, and then she assumes that probably this was an invitation to this meeting, so she does a little bit of good analysis, and finds out that Tom was actually sending, Dear Alice, let's meet in the park tonight. Now, by the way that the one-time pad works, 
if you know the message in the pad, then, well, if you know, the, sorry, if you know the message in the pad, you can also, if you know the message in the ciphertext, you can recover the pad. And then once you know the pad, then you can also decrypt any other ciphertext. So down here, um, since I've been using addition module 16, I now have to do a subtraction instead of um, just adding module 2. So the pad is the ciphertext C1 minus the message C1, C1 Alice has anyway, and the message 1, um, sorry, C1 Eve has anyway, and then the message 1 Eve recovers by watching them. And now having this pad P, they can totally recover the rest. So at that point, um, Eve knows the string P, and whatever Tom sends next, maybe Tom next sends the message to Bob, that it only starts with the first four, uh, four plus the space, so first five characters, and then something else. But Eve has already gotten the pad, and therefore that's all the secrets. Actually, this is not specific to the one-time pad. The same will happen if you're using with a stream cipher. If Tom and Alice are using a stream cipher to encrypt, and even if they have a nice key and have a secure cipher, from everything I told you so far, the stream, the S that they would be using, would be exactly the same in both cases. So whether this is a K for one-time pad, or an S for the stream cipher pad, or Visionaire cipher, it doesn't matter, because all of those would be using the same beginning over and over again. So we have to adjust our definition of stream cipher. We have to take into account that um, we must never use the same as again. So from what I've told you so far, that Alice and Bob have to remember how often they put, uh, turned the cranks so or how many bits or bytes they have generated from their stream, and then keep track of that, and then continue the next time, say they use the first 20 characters or 20 uh, bytes, and then the next time they have to start from the 21st. So that means they either have to keep a state, like how far they've gotten, and then can continue from here. And if they don't need the computer for anything else, then that might be okay. But typically you want to use something else with your computer. Your program crashes, something happens. So if then, well, the next time they hopefully remember it was 21, but then they have to advance till 21. And then the next time it is till 40 and it grows and it gets more and more cumbersome because they're having all of these pseudo-random bits generated till they can actually start generating some that they want for the key string. Also, if Alice ever sends a message to Bob and it doesn't reach Bob, then they will be desynchronized. So the next time Bob will think they're starting at 40, while Alice thinks they're starting at 60, and then they're just getting gibberish out of this. So what modern stream servers are actually doing is that they increase um, what the input is. So they, they don't just take a key as input, so that's K here, but they also take what we call an initialization vector, an IV. And this IV gets fed into the stream cipher as a second input. So it takes both the key and the IV to produce a key stream. And then for the next message, well, Alice and Bob will continue using the same K, but they will use a different IV. And when you encrypt, then you're sending this IV along. So the encryption passes the IV along so that then the receiving end can generate the same as. So the encryption goes through two stages. Basically, it takes the IV and the key, computes an S, and then takes the IV, the message, and this S and produces a ciphertext where the first component of the ciphertext is the IV and the second component, like before, is the message plus this uh, output stream. When we describe a stream cipher in theory, we're always talking about that the stream is infinite. We're talking about combinations of zero, ones, star, that means arbitrary long messages. But of course, in the end, they know how long the message is that they want to encrypt. So they might either know they have exactly n bits to encrypt and therefore generate n bits of a stream, or they have a bound on how many they encrypt at once. So they generating at most one gigabyte or some reasonable number which then will use for this one message. So in reality, there is no star on there. In reality, there's some n 
which is either a bound or the exact length of the message to be encrypted. So this is the skeleton into which we're going to now look at what stream ciphers are. And so what we're going to do next is looking at stream ciphers um, mathematical theory, looking at the linear feedback check registers, and then how they can be used. And we're also going to look at RC4. So those are the stream ciphers we will study in detail and we'll use, see some more ways of how to build a stream cipher from other ingredients. But that's it for today. So this was just about the theory so that you understand that the stream cipher is taking a key and an initialization vector as input and producing key stream. And of course, you must send along this IV, otherwise the other side can't decrypt it. But there is not necessarily a requirement on this IV being unpredictable. So it can be a counter, it can be a random number, but it should be such that you never ever hit the same one again. So if you're having a random number and, well, want to ensure that you never hit the same one again, your random number has to be sufficiently large. Anyway, thanks for your attention. Thank mm -hmm. you.